afternoon. Thank you for having me all the way from San Francisco. I'm gonna do just sort of a quick summary of who I am and why I'm doing what I'm doing, which will sort of segue right into the moderator uh, panel. Um, so I'm in the business of bias, as mentioned in my bio, um, primarily because it's a very costly um, challenge for a lot of companies. As we know, unconscious bias impacts um, employer brand, attrition, quality of hire, um, but most notably is diversity, which is a hot topic, particularly in Silicon Valley, where I live, um, as a lot of tech companies have been spending um, a lot of money trying to solve this problem over the past five years um, with, with minimal results. And we realized that we couldn't focus on diversity because ultimately uh, diversity or the lack thereof is the byproduct of unconscious bias. It's not the real focal uh, point of the problem. And so a lot of companies um, have claimed it to be a pipeline problem, so I'd like to talk a little bit about my story. Um, I was born in Southeast Washington, D.C. to a single mom who at one point was homeless while pregnant with me. But as luck would have it, she moved to Maryland where her sister was studying computer science at the University of Maryland College Park. So I always tell people my first image of a computer scientist was someone who looked like me, not a guy in hoodie and flip-flops. Um, and so that later became uh, really, really important in my trajectory. I learned to code at 13, full stack developer by 15, got into Stanford, engineering degree, had a technical internship every summer, um, and participated in a lot of organizations focused on getting more underrepresented minorities in STEM. And this is in the early 2000s. So got a job for Microsoft right out of college, often a double, as a double minority, invisible, um, not seeing myself represented in a lot of these spaces, um, and also not really getting the career growth opportunities. Uh, so I left Microsoft at, after about five years and went to MIT Sloan for business school. Um, Six months after graduating from Sloan, I interviewed for an analytical lead role at Google in New York. Thought it went really well, made it to the final rounds of the interview process, but the recruiter came back and said, sorry, <laughs> we don't think you're quite technical enough, but we're gonna hang on to your resume in case some more sales or marketing position opens up. I found out that out of 55,000 employees at the time, Google only had about 12 African-American women in technical roles. And again, the narrative was it's a pipeline problem. We just can't find women with the right degrees um, and underrepresented minorities that have the education level. So I took my non-technical self and built the first version of the app. And we, <laughs> thank you. And what started off as a talent marketplace uh, for diverse talent, sourcing diverse talent through multiple channels, um, has now evolved into the enterprise software that we are working with today. And Google is a customer. Um, Laszlo Bach is one of our angel investors. Um, and overall, things have been going pretty well. I got a few magazine covers. It's been nice, uh, post-Google rejection. Um, but startup life is really hard, um, and all that glitters isn't gold. If you look closely, I'm actually wearing the same shirt in two out of the three of those covers. So. Very surprising, right? Uh, even panel, uh, gender-wise, and the women the completely shut it down, right? And this, is, this happens quite a bit. And it's to the point where, you know, you just want to give up, right? <laughs> but fortunately, un unfortunately, I realized um, through the data that it's not just me, right? So 2.2% of all venture capital money last year went to women-founded companies. Um, but another number a lot of people don't know is that 0.02% went to African-American women. Um, that's 2.2 divided by 100, for those of you not good at math. Um, so ultimately, there are about 40 black women in the entire world ever to raise a million dollars in venture capital. Um, and I realized that, okay, this is actually a big problem, right? It only validates the theory of the impact of unconscious bias, financially, um, social impact, et cetera. And so it really sort of drives me. It's, it can be really struggling. It can be a real struggle. But it still drives and validates a lot of what we're doing. Um, and so in many ways, we're focused on anonymization, right, by removing candidate identifying information. But we're also super focused on gathering demographic information so that we can demonstrate transparency to recruiters about their decision making over time. So we track how far along different demographics of qualified candidates perform at every stage of the funnel, so you as an individual a recruiter or hiring manager have some visibility in the impact of your decision making and where bias may be um, playing a factor. 
And so we figured out a way to productize sort of the idea of, of mitigating human bias. But what we're also learning is there are a lot of AI companies that are doing talent matching that are incorporating a bit of algorithmic bias. Here's a software company that uses things like how quickly you were promoted in your previous role to determine your potential as a candidate. Well, that's a metric we know to be inherently biased, disproportionately negatively affecting uh, high performing women. And so what's happening is you're baking in bias into these initial screening softwares that's perpetuating um, systematic effects over time. And this is not unique to HR. We see it in facial recognition software where um, a lot of the times the accuracy is trended towards people who are male and or fair skin, which comes off as an inconvenience for someone like me when I can't unlock my phone or my computer because it doesn't recognize my face, um, but becomes a more serious issue when an autonomous vehicle can't see me crossing the street or their healthcare and criminal justice applications that affect my livelihood as a human being because of the AI that's produced. And livelihood around people are why we're here, why we're here right? So Amazon attempted to create a bot that scanned resumes using historical data sets that ended up being more biased than human reviewers because they were leveraging who had applied before. So garbage in, garbage out, right? Everyone's familiar with that concept. Um, and so I've dedicated my entire career to not only building technology focused on mitigating human bias, but understanding ways in which we can sort of pinpoint even the algorithmic bias that's happening um, throughout the people operations process. And so I'm operating in a space that's dominated by people that don't look like me um, and that are very much responsible for the technology that controls some of the outcomes of my life. It's, I'm really passionate about it. And I always say no one's more incentivized to solve this problem than a 411 gay black woman. Um, it's very much aligned, very much, um, what they say, a founder market fit, right? Um, but, you know, along the way, I get moments of strength. And I think that's what we're going to talk a little bit about here. Um, just how do you rise from adversity? Well, a few years ago, actually more than a few, 2015, I was invited to the first ever White House Demo Day. And a gentleman there said something very interesting that I was really glad got recorded. Here it is. Next Steve Jobs might be named Stephanie. <laughs> Next Steve Jobs might be named Stephanie. This is my reaction. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> That was great. Thank you so much for sharing your story, Stephanie, and your product. Um, so I want to ask you a little bit more about bias and diversity. So there's been some really cool research that's been done over the years by Tessa Dover and some of her colleagues showing that messages promoting diversity can sometimes threaten some employees in the organization. They feel like those messages promoting diversity or countering bias can come at the expense of others. What do you say to companies when you hear that reaction or to kind of circumvent that, those feelings of threat? Yeah, I think it really has to be positioned around what sort of assets are we acquiring as a result of having people with diverse backgrounds involved um, in innovating and um, expanding into different markets. When we talk about um, you know, other business uh, changes, whether you're, you know, you're expanding internationally or you're trying to cap capture a different demographic um, in, in terms of your market, it seems to be a much easier conversation. It seems to make more sense to people that, oh yeah, if we're selling to women, we probably should have a woman in the room. I think that same mindset needs to be applied um, and, and sort of the messaging should be more aligned with what are we actually gaining as a result of, uh, of these changes and really knowing that it's not lowering the bar um, or it's not a zero sum game where you know this white person won't be hired because this mm -hmm. African American um, is, but uh, just understanding the, the actual assets. Cool. So it's, it's nice that you brought up kind of this idea of obviously increasing innovation, promoting divergent viewpoints. Does, I sometimes wonder, does focusing on the business case for diversity, does it ever have any drawbacks? Because we often hear that you should really focus on the business case when you're trying to create change in an organization. Yeah, I don't think there's any silver bullet approach in terms of like focus on this one thing or this one way to sort of message the, the benefits. Mm -hmm. um, I do know that when you only talk about the business case and not the social impact or um, 
you know, just how inclusion, just not having bodies, but inclusion as well, is important. Um, you sort of you sort of lose out on the actual benefit that you're gaining from bringing different people into your organization yeah. because then it becomes okay how can we trace this to our bottom line um, which may not be apparent right away yep. and so if that's the only metric that you're using to sort of um, identify efficacy then uh, I think you'll lose a lot of people over time because um, it's just not that cut and dry. That's interesting. So kind of thinking about the long term versus short term. And if you don't see those benefits right away and you're really just making the business case, then people might not give as much leeway to kind of see the change. In you. Exactly. Cool. So one of the things that I think is really cool about your product is that even though it's focused on people analytics, it still involves the decisions of humans. Was that very deliberate on your part or was that just something that came about during kind of piling the technology? Yeah, I think this is a theme we see a lot actually here at the conference around augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. Like humans, I think I saw uh, on a slide, humans plus algorithms is greater than humans or algorithms, right? Um, because what we realize is there's a huge opportunity for behavior change if we're able to create a product that is not threatening but informative about mm. where bias is happening, because it's a very sensitive topic. Um, and you want to, it's a carrot and stick issue. You want to incentivize people to sort of keep a pulse on this, but also um, not shy them away from using it because it could affect their um, performance review, right? Yeah. Um, so we've sort of understood that we need buy-in um, from the humans uh, to really get a widespread adoption and scale. Um, and so have to do it in a way where it seems like business intelligence and not just, yeah. um, you know, another way that people are being measured. The other interesting that I think the other interesting thing about your technology is that it, of course, increases you know, the number of qualified applicants that you're seeing at that first stage, that first round. Of course, we also know that bias happens during the interview mm -hmm. and at the selection process you know, when people are visiting the company. What are some steps that companies are taking to combat this side of bias? Yeah, so um, definitely bias is, it permeates throughout every uh, stage of, of the hiring process. So a lot of companies are doing things like structured interviews, ensuring that everyone is asked the exact same questions. Um, um, many companies now are using companies like Textio to um, debias their job descriptions. Um, some companies are ensuring that when, you know, whenever you have a panel of, of managers, that they're diverse, right? So it's not just um, one, one group interviewing uh, certain candidates, et cetera. Um, those are probably the most common strategies that we've seen successful. Okay. Um, so as you look out into this space, you know, 10 years into the future, I know there are a lot of people here that are either working in people analytics or we obviously have some students who are interested in going into it. Mm -hmm. When you look at this space 10 years in the future, paint a picture. What do you think it looks like? How has it changed? How is it similar? I think it's the, the predictive analytics that we've sort of seen work already for uh, the Netflix and Amazons of the world, right? Where we have enough data to um, realize that you know, we can correlate different signals to performance. Um, and we're connecting all of, all of the dots. Uh, I think fundamentally, uh, HR has, you know, traditionally been a function that isn't very tech forward. Um, but as that changes, I see uh, being in a position where, you know, you have an algorithm that can recommend a candidate, and it's far more accurate than our human brains could, you know, possibly be. Um, but you have that level of trust, much the same way that you trust Amazon to say, oh, because you purchased this, these things, we know that you would like these things, etc. Um, th so getting more into the predictive, I think, is the is is really where things are headed. It's, it's interesting you bring that, and one of the things I love about this conference, of course, is that people analytics, I mean, HR, it was one of the most forward-thinking fields, you know, back in the 1900s, 1910s, and over time it kind of lost a little bit of its luster, and now you see it, everyone's talking about big data, everyone's talking about people analytics. Um, you see it everywhere. We're also seeing um, a trend of CHROs being, uh, having a much bigger pre presence on the um, executive team um, and even going into CEO positions. And that's always a really good signal because usually uh, when you look at who's considered uh, you know, a part of the executive team, the CHRO isn't you know, in the right. room. Um, but that's, that's definitely changing. That's cool. So uh, you know, I teach a class on power and politics and organizations here at Warden. And one of the things we talk about on the second day is how do you detect power in your organization? One of the most common answers is, well, who becomes CEO of the company, right? right. Uh, so it's an interesting signal that you bring up. Um, we only have a couple minutes left. Um, one thing I always like to do with guest speakers is do what I like to call the rapid fire round. 
in which I love to kind of play this game. So Stephanie, if you'll indulge me for a minute, um, I'll explain how it works. Um, so I'm gonna ask you a series of rapid fire questions and you're gonna give me the first answer that comes to mind. Okay. It can be the first word, it can be one word, but it can't be longer than a sentence. Okay. All right? This could be dangerous, but. It totally can be dangerous. <laughs> and that's why I'm so nice that I allow you to use, I allow you to say pass, but you can only say it once. Okay. And you have right. no idea how many questions I'm gonna ask you, but of course we have a timer here, so All you right. can probably guess. All right. Um, so here, we're gonna start with this one. Texting or talking? Texting. Drake or Kanye? Kanye. I'm not proud of that, by the way. <laughs> me, but... me neither. Me neither, <laughs> to be clear. I know this is on video, but I'm not proud of it either. Fill in the blanks. People analytics is about? People analytics is about the way we see and measure the world. Cool. Yes or no? Can we ever eradicate bias? No. Power or influence? Mmm, power. When you are seen as an underdog, you feel blank. Empowered. Cool. When getting things done at work, ask permission or beg forgiveness? <laughs> beg forgiveness. <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> Complete the sentence, last one for you. Uh, when you were 25 years old, you wish you had known? Ooh. When I was 25 years old, I wish I would have known that choosing your spouse is the most important decision that you can make in your entire life. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a perfect place to leave it at. Thank you so much for joining us, Doug. Thank you. Great job.